Hi, I want to welcome you to our Bible study here at Bible Talk as we continue on in our study of the Sermon on the Mount. And a good study it has been so far. And that's an unbiased opinion I'll yes. have, you know. Uh, but no, it is good because it's the Word of God. Amen. And that's, that's a fact. Hallelujah. And anytime we get together, gather together, and get into the Lord's Word, it'll be a blessing to Amen. us. <clears throat> uh, right? This is our 12th week in this in this study mm -hmm. and uh, we left off in our last session talking about Jesus the law and the prophets right. when in the Sermon on the Mount he said and let me just read this to you uh, do not think that I came to abolish the law or the prophets I did not come to abolish but to fulfill and that's what we talked about last week and by the way if you did not see last week's study it really is important that you do take time yes, find time absolutely. To, to watch that because it'll bring up the speed on what we're talking about here today and it's really a terribly important topic um, it's the foundation of Christianity it is but so that that study is available here online as all of the studies are mm -hmm. and so you can go back and if you if you haven't seen it go back and watch that or go and watch that if you have seen it and you know it's there for you to see again over uh, and over and over and over, 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 over. You always again. find something new in it and probably as important invite others to go watch it absolutely yes uh, and it, it's not because of the importance of my teaching it's about the importance of the word of god and i promise you that as we get in this and if, if i do anything it's to to challenge you yes to converse with god about these spark things of, yeah yeah a fire going in your heart so uh last week we talked about the law and i just want to end up because where we, where we ran out of time last week was talking about the fact that the law, which is still holy, still good, and yes. Jesus said hasn't been thrown away, mm -hmm. but it's our understanding of what our relationship to the law is and how that affects our relationship to God. Yes. And just to recap, in case you missed, I want to make sure that it's clear here today that we are saved by faith, and that's, that's God's grace, and it's a gift not by the works of the law. Mm -hmm. Having said that, that doesn't mean that the law is bad and without, without purpose in our lives. So we're talking about just looking at the Ten Commandments. It, I just want to say that it is the tutor that leads us to Jesus Christ. It is a tutor that leads us to Jesus Christ. But then it has purpose because it'll continue to, to, it will continue to teach us greater and greater understanding yes. of Jesus and His grace. Uh, I, I, I will sidetrack myself right off the bat. I mean, it's, when you understand the law, as you study the law, and when I talk about the law, we're talking about what the Jewish people call a Torah, right? Mm -hmm. and, and the prophets, and the whole thing is uh, the Tanakh, the, 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 all the scriptures. But just for example, in the law, God made it a law that there is no, there is no forgiveness of sin without the shedding of blood. Now, you may think, okay, that was the law then. No, no, that's still the law today. That's unchanging. You know, let, let's establish a couple of things. God spoke to the prophet Isaiah, and he said, you know, the, the, the grass withers and the flower fades, but the word of God stands forever. God is not a man that he should change. That's what it says mm -hmm. in the word. Mm -hmm. And in the New Testament, just if we want to get some New Testament in here, Jesus Christ, who is the word, the word made flesh who dwelt among us, is the same yesterday, today, and yes, forever. Hallelujah. All right? So, the law says that without the shedding of blood, there is no forgiveness of sins. There's no atonement without the shedding of blood. That's in Leviticus, I think, uh, Leviticus chapter 17. The reason it's important is because I've had so many people say to me, particularly, you know, unsaved people say, why would Jesus have to die? Why, why, why didn't God just wave a magic wand and make it all better? Well, I can't tell you why he made that law, but the law he did make, and that's a fact. And then in Isaiah, go to the prophets, so we get to cover the law and the prophets. In Isaiah chapter 43, I think it's verse 25, the Lord says that he himself will atone for our sins. Mm -hmm. Well, now we apply just the tiniest bit of logic here. And it says that there has to be the shedding of blood for the forgiveness of sins. 
And the Lord says, well, I'm going to do the atoning work for you. Right. Gosh. Then the Lord has to believe. Yes, He does. Jesus Christ on the cross is fulfilling. He is the Lamb of God, fulfilling the laws of Passover. All right? And by the way, as we record this, we're coming right up to the Passover. Um, so, you know, it, He is indeed the fulfillment of both the law and the prophets. But they are valid today, and that's what Jesus is saying. The law and the prophets are valid today. We just have to understand that our righteousness, our right standing with God, is not based on our adhering to the Lord, to the law, rather, mm -hmm. but Christ adhering to the law, doing what we could not do ourselves to live sinless. And do, he was the only one who never lived without breaking the law. He's the only one right? that can live that. But where we right, exactly. But where we were last week, we were talking about you. You can basically look at the law and break it into three parts. There is that part of the law that has it's about our relationship with God. There is that part of our law is about our relationship with other human beings, mm -hmm. and there is that part of the law that just concerns us. All right. And so I'm just I'm kind of being a little redundant and covering because this is exactly where we left off last week. And I said, you know, look at the Ten Commandments. There are the laws that pertain just to our relationship with God. Mm -hmm. When he says, I am the Lord, your God. You shall have no other gods before me. You shall not make for yourself an idol, a likeness of what's heaven and earth. In other words, you know, any, any idols. And you shall not take the name of the Lord, your God, in vain. All right? Those are about, this is law that talks about the way we re react or, re you know, respond to God. Then he says, remember the Sabbath to keep it holy. We don't make, this is not about doing something bowing down before God when we keep the Sabbath. Because Jesus Christ revealed this in the New Testament. Mm -hmm. When he said, hey, the Pharisees, if there was one thing they did not understand, it was the laws particularly regarding the Sabbath. the Sabbath. And he said, you know, man wasn't made for the Sabbath. We're not made so we can keep the Sabbath. Mm -hmm. He said the Sabbath was made for us. Because what God is revealing is we need this day of rest, this day set apart, mm -hmm. a day of rest. And as Mark, well, by the way, our, our dear brother Mark is a little under the weather. That's why he's not joining us here today. Um, so pray for Mark. And he can use the prayers even after he gets better. So, <laughs> uh, so that's a, a law, and like a lot of the dietary laws and everything. That wasn't about okay. This is you got to do this to to please God. This was this was laws that were meant to bless us. You know, people talk about okay, we're, we're learning all this stuff. Why is it that that Moses lived to 120 years old? Why is it that so many of the you know the ancients in the Bible lived so long? Maybe it has something to do with they lived a healthier life based on the law. Now the thing is, not eating ham and cheese sandwiches does not affect your relationship with God. And, you know, I'm being a little facetious because you're not, that's under the law. You can't have ham, you know, a glass of milk and a ham and cheese sandwich. But perhaps these things that the Lord revealed would make us healthier. They yes. bless and benefit us. All right? So it's not about your relationship with God. It's just about you. And then God said, okay, don't murder, don't commit adultery. Don't. Well, those things, you know what? They are still there today. Absolutely. Hello. Yes. But all of these can be encompassed in one word. And that one word is love. Mm -hmm. Love the Lord. Love the Lord completely, totally, absolutely. That's a real poor paraphrase of Deuteronomy, right? And then love your neighbor as yourself. Mm -hmm. Your neighbor as yourself. You've got to love your neighbor and you've got to love yourself. Not, not in a prideful way, but it's like taking care of yourself and everything, right? And he says, in that is the law and the prophets. So it always boils down to law. Now, there are people who are legalistic. I just want to bring this into to play. And legalistic people are the ones who demand, okay, if you don't keep this law right to the letter of the law, you, you know, God's going to cast you off. That's not right, because it is God's grace, all right? Uh, on the other hand, there's a thing that Paul dealt with he called licentiousness. And licentiousness is comes from the word like, like a driver's license. It's permission. 
And God's grace does not give us permission to sin. That's the other extreme. And if you think of this, you know, the way is narrow that leads to life. Right? Yes. How narrow is it? I often say, you know what? It's almost like a tightrope. Mm -hmm. And Satan wants to push you off. That's all he cares about, getting you off that, that righteous, narrow path. But he doesn't care which way you go. He doesn't care if you go towards legalism or you go towards licentiousness. So what is that narrow way? It's called the royal law. The royal law of love. Mm -hmm. And love is that path that we are supposed to walk. And after all, Paul wrote to Timothy and said the goal of our instruction is love. All right. So I, I just want you to think about that. The key to understanding the law today is this. Jesus Christ said in John 10.10, He said, I came that they might have life and have it abundantly. His desire is that we have abundant life. And by the way, in the Gospel of Luke, he says, even when a man has abundance, his life does not consist of his possessions. So we're not talking about stuff, and Jesus wasn't talking about stuff. That's not what makes an abundant life. And then he said in John 15 and John 16, John 15, 11 and John 16, 24, twice he said, he came that, that our joy might be made full. So the purpose of Christ coming and fulfilling the law and the prophets is that we would have life abundant and joy made full. So when he makes these, and by the way, he, he is the one, not Moses, who was the lawgiver, mm -hmm. who brought, brought the law, right? His purpose in his word is to bring life abundant and joy filled. Well, the law is part of his word. Yes, it is. And the prophets are speaking God's word. Mm -hmm. So the purpose of God's law and the purpose of God's prophets is to bring that abundant, joy-filled life. Mm. If you have an attitude that you start off with this mindset, oh, the, the, the law is bad. And by the way, that's one of the questions Paul said, is the law evil? May no, it never be. Never. All right? that it's our understanding that goes astray oftentimes. His, his word, God's word, the law and the prophets express God's desire to teach the way that we might have all the fullness of joy and the abundance of life. So remember how Jesus started this sermon, the Sermon on the Mount. How did he start? It was all instruction on how to be blessed. Exactly. That's his Enjoyable. desire. Yeah. A okay. Life. So, and by the way, those things, all his instruction on how to be blessed, what we call the Beatitudes, and I, I've said this before in the study, and I'm going to say it a lot of times before I'm through, I'm sure. There's not a single suggestion in there. Mm. Those are the commands of God. And commands are meant to be obeyed. Jesus said, if you love me, keep my commandments. All right, so I'm going to get away from, from the law for the moment, all right? Okay. But... As I said, if you didn't hear last week's study, please go watch it, right? Mm -hmm. So let's talk now about the prophets. Prophet comes from, in the Greek here that we're studying, all right? Prophet comes from the word prophetes, all right? Mm -hmm. Which literally means pro, means either for or before, okay? Yes. And, and phetes, literally in Greek means speaker, it comes from the word uh, to speak. So a prophet speaks for God. Okay? Yes. He has to speak for God what God has given him to speak. A prophet speaks for God and may not speak on his own. Mm -hmm. He has to speak God's word. He's in big trouble if he does. But by the same token, you know, there are prophets even, even today. You know, it says that God has appointed in the church apostles, prophets, right there, mm -hmm. number two. Apoph apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastors, and teachers to equip the saints for the work of service, mm -hmm. to the building up. Okay. That's today. But every Christian has a prophetic ministry because we are all called to bring God's word. Mm -hmm. I mean, you know. Not all of us are quote-unquote evangelists. Mm -hmm. 
But we're all called to share the good news of Jesus Christ with exactly. people we encounter, yes. right? The thing is that Paul wrote and said that we are ambassadors for Christ. Now, an ambassador is basically somebody that a nation, like America, America, the United States of America, would send an ambassador to Pango Pango. Mm -hmm. And the purpose of that ambassador from the U.S. in Pango Pango is to speak on behalf of the United States. That makes him a prophet. I want to tell you, there's a, there's a real relationship between ambassadors and prophets, all right? Mm -hmm. And an ambassador is not supposed to speak what his opinion is, what his thoughts are. He is supposed to speak the official line of the country he represents. Yes. So we are too. It says, you know, Peter, New Testament, mm -hmm. after the death, after the burial, after the resurrection, after the ascension of Jesus Christ, the Apostle Peter says, if any man speaks, let him speak as it were the oracles of God. Mm -hmm. So we all have that prophetic role, but there are prophets whose life is given to given to doing nothing but speaking God's word, right? Uh, that, by the way, is not, they don't get jobs on this Christian psychic mm -hmm. hotline just telling you, you know, how romance is around the corner and great wealth is, that's, that's not prophecy. That's an abomination, but that's another story. That's fortune telling. Okay. So if it's about bringing God's word, then you have to remember this. Because the Apostle Paul says all scripture is inspired by God. God breathed and profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, for training in righteousness. So that the man of God may be adequate, equipped for every good work. Mm -hmm. So prophecy, true prophecy, bears the same weight as scripture. Yes. All right, because you're speaking for God. Now, I'm talking about true prophecy, and that's why, it, because it carries that weight of Scripture, that it has to be, prophets have to be tested. God spoke in the law, in Deuteronomy 18.20, and He said, But the prophet who speaks a word presumptuously in my name, which I have not commanded him to speak, or of which he speaks in the name of other gods, that prophet shall die. You see, there are tests for, for the prophets, all right? Um, it, when Jesus talks in verse 19, now in verse 19 is what we're at here, all right? Whoever then annuls one of the least of these commandments and teaches others to do the same shall be called least in the kingdom of heaven. But whoever keeps and teaches him, he shall be called great in the kingdom of heaven. Think of what it said. Whoever teaches, uh, whoever then annuls one of the least of these commandments, well, when he talks about commandments, he is encompassing, put this in the context here, the law and the prophets. Because when the prophets spoke, like I said, God doesn't make suggestions. This, by the way, once again, I, I think it's important, I'll bring this up. I hear the word used in the church all the time, every place I go today, mm -hmm. and nobody talks about discipleship anymore. No. Everybody no, talks about I'm mentoring. Sure. And, you know, that's, that's, that's so common, and I'm going to tell you what problem I have with that, and what problem you should have with that. Mentor is actually a person. It comes from Greek mythology. And when a king went off, in ancient, in ancient Greece, went off to war, he left this man named Mentor to advise his son. Mm -hmm. So a mentor is an advisor. It's like if you have a financial advisor, all right, and you go, he tell, he doesn't tell you, okay, you do this and you've got to do it. He's making suggestions to you. He's giving you advice. And then you can choose to do that or not. He has that, no authority. He has no authority over you. Mm -hmm. That's what mentors are. Now, they have their place out there in the world. They can make suggestions. They are there because they, they theoretically... They have great knowledge on a subject so they can give advice. Mm -hmm. Prophets don't give advice. No, no. They give the commands of God. Right, right. Discipleship is about a relationship between a master, mm -hmm. our Lord, and those followers of His. Mm -hmm. Mentoring is about somebody who makes suggestions. Mm -hmm. There are no suggestions in the Word of God. They are the commands of God. And be clear on that. You know, he is Lord.
we sing the song, He is Lord, we talk about He is Lord. Well, I'm telling you that the Lord doesn't make suggestions. When He says something, it is to be done. All right. So, when it comes to prophets, that's what's, why it's so important to test them. And that's particularly true in the later days, which we are in, all right? So, John said, Beloved, do not believe every spirit, but test the spirits to see whether they're from God, because many false prophets have gone out into the world. That's 1 John 4, 1. And think of this in Jesus. Uh, Jesus said, when he was asked by his disciples about the end days mm -hmm. and the signs in Matthew 24, Jesus warned, many false prophets will arise and me mislead many. That's Matthew 24, 11. He's talking specifically about the last days when there will be this, this abundance of false prophets. Now, a, if a prophet is not one who speaks for God, a quote-unquote prophet is somebody who claims to speak for God. Mm -hmm. And they need to be tested. One of the ways they need to be tested is, you want to know something? God doesn't make mistakes. And if a prophet makes a mistake, that means he wasn't hearing from God. He was speaking on his own. Want me to read that verse again? Yes. If a prophet speaks a word presumptuous in my name, which I have not commanded him to speak, of which he speaks in an or he speaks in the name of the God, that prophet shall die. Now, you, I don't know if you know this, but I mean, there are gigantic religions, cults, that exist in the world today that are built on false prophecies. Yes. <clears throat> Known false prophecies. Mm -hmm. I mean, you know, somebody says, says they, they give a prophecy saying, Jesus Christ is going to return to earth on this time, in this time. And I'm not, I'm not talking about this last one. Mm -hmm. I'm talking about going back into the late 1800s. And he doesn't come. So they just pass it over and say, oh, okay. Well, religions are built on that and millions of people are following it. Mm -hmm. And that's just one. If that word that a prophet speaks in the name of God does not come to pass, it was not God. And if it was not God, that prophet is a liar. And if that prophet is a liar, guess where he's getting his word from? There is one who is a liar by nature and the father of lies. And I hope you know who I'm talking about. Okay. So... When, when Jesus warns about false prophets, he is warning specifically about, like the law, people speaking of what God, not man, has spoken. Mm -hmm. right? Now, like the law, for the Lord's prophet for the purpose is to bring joy and life. Right? The word, the word of God is joy. The word of God is joy. That's why John the Baptist said that his joy was made full because he heard the voice of the bridegroom. He heard the voice of Jesus Christ and that's what made his joy full. Mm -hmm. This, you know, if God's word doesn't excite you and make you filled with joy, you kind of got to sit down and examine yourself. And by the way, over and over the word says, let a man so examine himself. Think of Jeremiah. Now Jeremiah had a life that, uh, here is a, a major prophet of God. Mm -hmm. And he said, thy word was found and I ate it. It became for me the joy and the delight of my heart. His life was a, a toughie, I'll tell you what. But his joy and his delight was in God's Word. Mm -hmm. What gives you joy? What gives you delight? God gave His Word that you can be filled with joy and delight. All right. So, but again, it is, it's the purpose of God's Word through a prophet is to bring both life and joy. And by the way, bringing life do not forget for a moment that Jesus Christ said, I am the life. I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes to the Father but through me. Now, that is a radical verse that upsets the rest of the world. Right? But if you want, we're talking about life, we're talking about Jesus. So the purpose of God's word is to bring you into a relationship with him through Jesus Christ. I was thinking about how when you were talking about the joy and hearing the voice of the bridegroom, but when you when you know God and when you know that He is faithful and He never fails you, I mean that brings joy. Knowing that well, whatever, true. I mean, no matter what He says, it's going to come to pass. This is why 
It's so, I mean, you know, we could sit here and go through a thousand scriptures. Right. But when the Apostle Paul in his letter to the Romans says, we know that all things work together for good, that's because we know, not, first of all, that nothing is impossible with God. Exactly, right. That He cares for us. That He has us right. in the palm of His hand where no man can snatch us out. All that, that safe, promises. That that safe place today in is not in your safe house or your safe room no. or your, no. it's in the, in, in the shadow of the Almighty. It's in the shelter of the Most High God. Did I get that right? Anyhow, that's where you'll find safety because that's what God's words, that's the word that God spoke yes. through prophets, right? But how, how important is prophecy today, real prophecy? Paul wrote to the Corinthians, pursue love, yet desire earnestly spiritual gifts, but especially that you may prophesy. For one who speaks in the tongue does not speak to men, but to God. For no one understands. But in his spirit, he speaks mysteries. But one who prophesies speaks to men for edification and exhortation and consolation. Mm -hmm. This is God's purpose. God, how do you think God is going to bring us to edify, to build you up? Through his word. Absolutely. And God will use prophets to do that. To exhort, to bring exhortation. You know what? We all fall short of the glory of God. We all miss the mark. We all sin. If anybody says that they have no sin today, they're a liar and make God to be a liar. That's what the Word says. That's right. But hallelujah, when we sin, if we're faithful to confess that sin to God, He is faithful and just to forgive it. That's His promise through His Word. That should bring you joy. Mm -hmm. Because we all fail and fall short. So, it's about building us, building us up. Remember, um, let me just go back and read Second Timothy again. All right, what's God's word for? It's profitable for teaching, for reproof, mm -hmm. for correction. That's exhortation. Yes. For training in righteousness. And what I said to you when we started this study twelve weeks ago was what the Sermon on the Mount is all about. This is the first sermon that Jesus preaches, mm -hmm. and he preaches this at the beginning of his ministry. Why? Because this is the instruction, this is the training in righteousness. The foundation. This is how you live. The Sermon on the Mount is how you live righteously. Right. right? So that's the purpose of God's Word. But it's important you understand, right, that, that Jesus has an eternal perspective. Right. It's not for just today. Not just for today. Mm -hmm. And this is something that we human beings seem to have a problem with. Mm -hmm. But you see, David knew this. And like David, we should, we should know how brief a portion of eternity our human lifespan is. All right? Absolutely. Yeah, you, you, you get what I said? Mm -hmm. This human, this from the time you exit the womb of your mother, mm -hmm. and, and life began prior to that, until the time you, know, you take your last breath here on earth, that is such an insignificant, infinitesimal, immeasurably small part of your life, right. of eternity, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. And David knew this. He said, Behold, you have made my days as hand breaths, and my lifetime as nothing in your sight. Surely, every man at his best is a mere breath. Mm -hmm. At Psalm 39.5. It's it when when the Lord is speaking to us when He's talking about bringing us life, He's not just talking about for these for these seventy years or whatever you have on this no, planet. No. He's talking about for all eternity. I mean, this is why you know God spoke through through Solomon back in Ecclesiastes three and eleven three eleven and said He's made everything appropriate in its time. He has also set eternity in our hearts. We have this knowledge of eternity built into us. But you don't understand it, and it's not fulfilled until you come into life in Jesus Christ. Mm -hmm. So people chase eternity in a thousand other ways. And in a thousand other ways, they will miss it every time. Because you can only find eternal life in Jesus Christ. All right? Now, I, I, I say this because... When we talk about the prophets, you've got to understand that the Lord is interested in what is best for us long term. Right. Right? There was a, a, a number of years ago, Alice and I were in Africa 
we were there. Mark was with us in Africa, and, and our dear brother Joe Flanagan was with us. And there was another guy that we met up with over in uh, West Africa. And he was preaching. And I remember him, you know, hearing him preach. And he was talking about how God will never allow pain to happen to you, never allow anything bad to happen to you. Mm -hmm. And he's going on and on and on and on and on. Mm -hmm. And I said, you know, that sounds nice, but it's entirely in error. You look at a parent here in the world who loves his child. Typically, you know, one of the things that's going to happen is the, your, the parents of that child, who love that child, are going to take that child and they're going to take him off to a doctor. And that doctor is going to give him what they call in England a jab. Mm -hmm. Stick him with a needle. Give him a vaccination for something. We do, right? Absolutely, yeah. Why? Why? What kind of rotten parent are you that you would make your child endure this pain? You know, it's like if, uh, I, I don't know how your kids are, but it's like once they know they're going to the doctor, get them in the car and they start screaming. Or it's like you take a, say to your puppy dog, we're going to the vet. <laughs> okay, watch what happens. They don't, you know, they don't like going there. They, there's this horrible anticipation. I, at least, you know, maybe, I don't know, maybe your kid likes getting needles. I, but I haven't met your kid, obviously. <laughs> But why would a loving parent allow that child to be subject <laughs> to the pain of a needle? Because they know the benefit of it. Because first of all, they know it's temporary. Mm -hmm. That pain right. is going, it comes and goes. You know, I, I, I've shared with you, I think many of you, at least most of you probably know my testimony. You know, I had polio when I was a kid, back when there was an epidemic of polio. I have been stabbed so many times by needles, it's in, just incredible. And then of course, you know, I was in the military, and ask anybody who was, in, who was in the military, especially in the old days, before they started using the needle guns and everything. Boy, you just walk down lines, and they'd be jabbing you left and right and right. And I came to the place where, as much as I hated needles, uh, I, I finally came to the realization, you know what? It's no big deal, because, yes, it'll hurt, particularly in the military. But it's going in a second, you know, and I can deal with that for a second because it's a long time benefit. Don't think that God will not allow you to be subject to some kind of pain that he understands is a vaccination to, that has long term benefit to you. We're gonna get our jabs in life. We're gonna get our jabs in life. Many are the afflictions of the righteous, mm -hmm. but the Lord delivers us out of them all. Okay, so uh, God's purpose is to bless us. His purpose is never to cause us harm. He is different than the Pharaoh of Egypt, which is why he sent his prophet, Moses, into the land of Egypt to deliver them, the people of God, right? right. Because the Pharaoh was a harsh taskmaster who was ruling over people for his own benefit. Mm -hmm. Right? God wants to bless us and benefit us. I was just trying to look for that, um, the scripture where it talks about the, the, um, the afflictions that we're going to get because it ends up building our character. Oh, there's, uh, there, there are many. I, you may be thinking of, I mean, there's so many. Yeah, I, I, I think what you're thinking of is Romans 5.5, five, I bet. I don't know if that's it, okay. Romans 5. Oh, okay. Yeah. Um, but this is why, you know, it is Paul who says, you know, Paul and James and John, and Jesus, and Peter. Mm -hmm. When we encounter these things, we're supposed to rejoice. That's right. Because we know what the end result will be. All right? So God's purpose in the word and prophecy, in the law and, and prophecy, some of it is, we may find in the natural particularly painful, but it's there to benefit and to bless us. Mm -hmm. Okay? Yes. So. It was. It was yeah. Romans, Alice was thinking of Romans chapter 5. Okay, so let me just read to you from Hebrews chapter 12. Yeah, I'm sure most of you know this. And if you didn't know already, you'll know in a minute. Mm -hmm. Hebrews 12, I'm going to read from verse 6 to 11. For those whom the Lord loves, he disciplines, and he scourges every son whom he receives. It is for discipline that you endure. God deals with you as sons. For what son is there whom his father does not discipline? But if you were without discipline, of which all have become partakers, then you are illegitimate children 
and not sons. Furthermore, we had earthly fathers to discipline, to discipline us, and we respected them. Shall we not much rather be subject to the Father of spirits and live? For they disciplined us for a short time, just as seemed best to them. But he disciplines us for our good, so that we may share his holiness. All discipline for the moment seems not to be joyful, but sorrowful. Yet, to those who have been trained by it, afterwards it yields the peaceful fruit of righteousness. So if indeed the Sermon on the Mount is training in righteousness, there are going to be times when God is asking us to do things that are going to be painful to us, at least in the natural. But it, you have to be trained to do this. When you have to love your enemy, I'll tell you, I, that's, that's difficult. That, well, it's, it's more than difficult. It is so abhorrent, so unnatural. And that's we're against our grain. But it's unnatural. Yes. It is very spiritual, but unnatural. So we have to learn and be trained to go through what is in the natural painful to us. Because it brings life. And oftentimes, not only will it bring life to us, but it'll bring life to others. And ultimately, that's what it's about, right? So prophets bring God's word for reproof, for correction, for exhorting. Now, the, the problem is, I, Alice and I have traveled around the world, a lot of places around the world. I have been blessed to preach in denominations, just dozens of, I won't say dozens, probably close to a dozen different denominations. Mm -hmm. And over and over and over, whether it's a mainline church, an evangelical church, or a Pentecostal church, I hear people say to me, oh, God, just, he's, you know, he's not harsh like in the Old Testament. This is the point of this study right now. There is no difference between the God of the Old Testament and the God of the New Testament. Yes. That's why Jesus said, don't think that I came to abolish the law and the prophets. Mm -hmm. It didn't change. Our understanding of the law and the prophets is supposed to change and grow because now we are indwelt by the Spirit of God who was sent to lead us to all truth. But think about what the prophets of yesteryear said. This is 2 Kings 17, 13. This will tell you a lot about the purpose of prophecy. Yet the Lord warned Israel and Judah through all his prophets and every seer, saying, Turn from your evil ways and keep my commandments, my statutes, according to all the law which I commanded your fathers and which I sent to you through my servants, the prophets. The purpose of prophets was to draw people when they were straying mm. from obeying the word of God, God would send the prophets to call them back. When they're being destructive. Right. Now, you can say, oh, well, God doesn't do that anymore. What do you mean God doesn't do that anymore? Let me go back and talk about the uh, parents today and children. If you have a little child and you're out in the front yard and you see your little child walking off into the street into traffic, what are you going to do? You're going, to, you're going to run, but you're going to scream and holler at that child, come back. What, are you doing that to be harsh? Are you doing that to punish them? No. Of course not. You're doing that because you see this as a life-giving call. And God sent the prophets to give this life-giving call, to call us away from the danger of sin. Because the wages of sin is death. Sin kills. Ezekiel 3, 17-19. Son of man, he's talking to Ezekiel the prophet, I have appointed you a watchman to the house of Israel. Whenever you hear a word from my mouth, warn them for me. When I say to the wicked, you will surely die, and you do not warn him or speak out to warn the wicked from his wicked way that he may live, that wicked man shall die in his iniquity, but his blood I will require at your hand. Yet, if you have warned the wicked and he does not turn from his wickedness or from his wicked way, he shall die in his iniquity, but you have delivered yourself. You know, we've been given a lot. We have been given the spirit. We've been given, first of all, we've been given life. Yes. The gift of life, eternal, through the atoning work of Jesus Christ on the cross. 
We have been given the Word of God. It says that the Word of God has been written on the tablets of our heart. We have been given the love of God. The love of God has been poured into our hearts through the Holy Spirit. We have been given the Holy Spirit. We are the temple of the Holy Spirit. But Jesus said, from whom much has been given, much is required. I think we are too casual, at least in the Western world. Uh, you know, in my travels in, in Western Europe and in here in the United States, it's like, you know, maybe we can win souls over by having coffee and donuts in the sanctuary. Listen to me. The Word brings life. And Christ, the holiness of Christ, Christ lifted up on a cross is what men will be drawn to. We are trying to make Christianity attractive to people because we think that's the way to win souls. Talking about the cross, if you go to Isaiah 53 and what God spoke through the prophet, and what he said was, and I'm paraphrasing, but he said that Jesus had no appearance that men should be attracted or drawn to him. Because he's talking about Jesus on that cross, bearing the weight of our iniquities and our sins in our place. Bloody, battered, and bruised in our place. Surely the iniquity of us all fell upon him. But it is when we lift Christ up like that and proclaim the cross of Jesus Christ, because Paul said that is the power of God unto salvation, that word of the cross. So put away your Dunkin' Donuts and your Starbucks coffee and start to preach the atoning work of Jesus Christ on that cross. That's what a prophet is supposed to do. And when you were talking about exhortation today, people are receiving exhortation as offensive words to them, and they're taking offense. Well, or they'll say, you're judging me. I mean, they're not receiving it at all. Okay. You're, Alice is absolutely right. And that just brings me to one other thing I'll say. I had uh, a woman in London come to me one time, and she, she had been to a seminar, and she came back and she was talking about how because there's so much offense out there today. Yes. And by the way, if you don't believe that, just turn on your telly mm -hmm. for a few minutes and watch how many uh, lawyers are advertising, sue this person, sue, sue somebody, right? <laughs> That's, okay, don't get me distracted. So anyhow, she said, you know, they, they talked a great length about offense, taking, you know, when somebody offends you, how do you deal with somebody who offends you? And that's what she came to me. She said, mm -hmm. how am I supposed to deal with people when they offend me? What am I supposed to, no, her exact what question, what am I supposed to do when somebody offends me? And I said to her, repent. Mm -hmm. And I mean, she was literally taken aback. And she said, what do you mean, repent? What do you mean I should repent? Why should I repent? They're the ones, because here's what the Word of God mm -hmm. says. That Word which brings us joy-filled, abundant life. Amen. Psalm 119, verse 165 says that those who love thy law shall have great peace and nothing shall offend them. If you are taking offense, forget with that other person, it's because you don't love God's law, His Word, enough. That's why. And your spirit is rising up and taking control. Yes. Because I you, mean, not your spirit, your flesh. Your flesh is taking control, right, yes. Right, yeah. If so, you're taking offense. If you're taking offense. So just, just remember, there's only one person whose words have any power over your life. Well, no, I shouldn't say that. There's actually there's, there's two people that have their words have power over your life. The first is God. Mm -hmm. His words have, have power in your life. Yeah. The only other one that I know of is you. Mm -hmm. Life and death is in the power of the tongue, it says in Proverbs. You have power over your life with what you allow to come out of your mouth. All right? And what you come out of your mouth is an indication of what you've stored up in your heart. For Christ said, out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. But nobody else does. I mean, somebody can walk through the store today and call me a sofa. Just don't try and sit on me. But, you know, you can call me what you want all day long. It's not going to offend me because that's no power over me. So get over it. But this goes back to the issue of don't, don't be hurt by these things. No. The only thing that matters is what God says about you. And that's why, again, I, I would say what Paul wrote to his son in the faith, Timothy, when he said in 2 Timothy chapter 2, he said, study to show yourself approved unto God. 
a workman who does not need to be ashamed. It's the approval of God. That, that's the only thing that matters. Not, not people. And, you know, well, I'll tell you another thing Paul said. He said, you can't please men and please God. It's impossible. Because they're just different. Mm -hmm. All right. So, but God's word is there to reprove us. Mm -hmm. If you are in a relationship, a discipleship relationship, and you wanted to be a better golfer than you are, and you want to hire a golf trainer and professional, a golf pro, to train you, mm -hmm. and all he does is tell you how good you are and what you're doing right, you want to know something he's doing you no good whatsoever. He's got to tell you what you're doing wrong, wrong to bring correction to that. We are supposed to, it says today, in Hebrews it says today, as long as it's still called today, we are to encourage one another. Right? We need to edify and build one another up. So yes, we're called to strengthen the things that are right. Okay? Mm -hmm. But we need to correct the things that are wrong. Because otherwise you don't grow. You, don't, you, don't, you will change, but it'll be a downward change and not an upward change. Okay. So let me, let me just... Um so I understand it. The the exhortation is is different than the reproof. Well, no, it, it is. Basically, Ex exhortation is kind of a call to to come to come back. Mm -hmm. So you can take that as a reproof. See, now the world has convinced us that these are negative things. Right, but they're not. But they are not negative things. They are positive things. It is that golf it's pro. The it is that golf yeah. pro saying, okay, no, what you yes, you're not holding the club right. You've got to change it to this. Right. So he's calling you away from what you're doing and into something new. That's God's purpose. That's God's plan. And that's the purpose of, of prophets. You know, I talked about Ezekiel. Jeremiah, and I mentioned Jeremiah earlier. Think about what Jeremiah spoke by the Spirit of God. Mm -hmm. The Lord has sent you to all his servants, the prophets, again and again. Yes. God sent the prophets over and over, mm -hmm. again and again. But you have not listened nor inclined your ear to hear, saying... Turn now, everyone, from his evil way and from the evil of your deeds and dwell on the land which the Lord has given to you and your forefathers forever and ever. Do not go after other gods to serve them and to worship them. Do not provoke me to anger with the work of your hands and I will do you no harm. So what I'm saying is, and I said this in the beginning, you know, that Jesus Christ, the Word, is the same yesterday, today, and forever. When I hear Christians tell me that God will not bring this message and it sounds, if you're in the flesh, I promise you it's going to sound a harsh message. That's what your flesh does. This is why David, when it comes to the discipline of the Lord, prayed. And he said, talking about, he said, send me your discipline. And he said, let not my head reject it, refuse it. We should be seeking the discipline of the Lord. Okay? So it's like God is going to send prophets. And the primary purpose of the prophets primary purpose is when we're astray and doing wrong it's like when we're headed into that street with traffic there is our father who will call us and say get out of that street mm -hmm. right now right this minute so it may sound harsh to your flesh but wander out to the street and say well you know oh. and see what happens there are so many people running around today they call themselves prophets and like I, is, like I said, it's kind of like the, I've, the Christian psychic hotline. You know, it's all about, oh, guy, why don't you just do this for you? Oh, guy wants... Well, you know what? The Word tells you what God wants to do, how He wants to bless you. What we really need is for God to raise up prophets today who will call us back into the paths of righteousness when we are straying off that path. And I believe that a, a, a true prophet is not going to have any problem speaking words that we'll, we'll seem as harsh and, and difficult to receive. And I don't think they'll have a problem saying them. They're not going to try to coat it or sugarcoat, you know, cover it over. Oh, no, not, they'll not, not try to sugarcoat it. Yeah. No. Uh, however, that doesn't mean that it's always pleasant for the prophet. Yeah. And it, no, it doesn't all, I mean, you know, one of, the, one of the great examples of that is this guy who was called by the Lord to be a prophet. And he was called to be a prophet to a land that was ungodly. Yeah. You know what I'm talking about? <laughs> I think so. Okay. Office at BibleTalk.com. So, <laughs> Jonah. God told him, oh, I ain't going there. Mm -hmm. 
I mean, again, you know, if you know the story of Jonah, if you don't know the story of Jonah, go read it this week. But he didn't want to go there. Yeah, that's true. But he got there. I mean, he tried to avoid it. They threw him off the boat. He winds up on a whale. He winds up going there. And when he got there, he brought the message of God. Repent. And you know what? The nation repented. The nation, the whole nation repented. And I think that upset him. <laughs> Is he the only prophet that really ran away from trying to follow him? No, I, no I, don't, I don't think so. I, I think there have been times. Because well, to, to be put, you know, let me just tell you something. Many years ago, I started my business life a long, long time ago as a consultant, a business consultant in New York City. And a lot of people don't get this because, I mean, that sounds, whoa, you're, you know, a business consultant. But basically, the purpose of a business consultant is to go in and tell companies what they're doing wrong. Yeah, right. That's true. I mean, if you're really going to profit them, you find what they're doing wrong. If they're doing it right, I mean, you can encourage them and, and you know, but that, that doesn't do anything. If they're doing it right... The only way you really benefit them is when you go in and find out what they're doing wrong. wrong. That's right. Yeah. And the fact of the matter is, by and large, people don't want to hear what they're doing wrong. No, no. Or everybody wants to hear, oh, you're doing right, you're doing great. Yeah, I mean, yeah. That's what our flesh wants. Sure, sure. So uh, uh, the job, the task of a prophet is often, I, I, I don't know the right word to use, quite frankly. I mean, is it difficult? Well... It's difficult to the flesh, oftentimes, yeah. because you're going out and saying, saying things that need to be said, that God is directing you to say, but you know that unless people receive it in the Spirit, they're not going to receive it well. But by the way, God has no sympathy about that. Yeah. I mean, it's like when he sent Ezekiel out. You know, at one so point he says to Ezekiel, nobody's going to pay attention, attention to you, to you, but you got to tell them. But you got to tell them, and they'll know that a prophet has been among them. Right. And once they've heard the word, they're responsible for the word. So, let, here's an important, really, really important verse when it comes to prophecy. When it comes to prophecy, starting, and by the way, the first time that the word prophet is used in the scriptures, I believe, is of Abraham, way back in Genesis, mm -hmm. right? Now, I, I don't believe that. I know that to be a fact, okay. all right? And then we have prophets and prophecy all the way through the New Testament. Mm -hmm. But it is important to remember this one fact. For the testimony of Jesus is the spirit of prophecy. When all is said and done, prophecy is not about us. It's about Jesus Christ. And it's about calling us back into that right relationship, always into that deeper and right relationship with Jesus Christ. The calling of God is an upward calling. The purpose of God is to change us. You know, I, I, I probably did share this before. I was in... Uh, uh, Oldham in England and I walked into this church and I was preaching there this morning and I got right up and I started to preach uh, oh. I caught the pastor by surprise because God told me to go preach I just got up and, and I said to the people in the congregation I said I'd like before I start to bring the message you guys give me I'd like to ask everybody to stand up and move go someplace sit someplace that you have never sat before in this building yeah. sit next to somebody that you have never sat next to before now, if you've been Christian and been going to church for a while, you know people become set in their ways. Mm -hmm. They'll sit in the same seat every single week. And when you, when you do this, for me to ask people to do that, it was a shock, first of all. Yeah. And you could see that this was a, a discomfortable thing. Mm -hmm. That's not a word. No. There was discomfort, discomfort on their part. It was an uncomfortable thing for them to do. Because in our flesh, we are so... You know, we don't like that kind of change. Like change. We, be, we become comfortable with what we know. But they did it out of respect for me and regard for what they perceived me as. And I said to them, I realize what a difficult thing that was. But I didn't do it to hurry. I did it to, to make a point. How resistant we are in the natural to change. And yet, the only reason God brought you into this building this morning, I said to these people, right. is because He desires to change you. Now, does He love you exactly where you are right now? Absolutely, yes. without doubt, without fail, the Lord loves you. More than you can understand. I promise you that. At least at this point. Right? And yet, 
He has made a promise. Because your name was written in the Lamb's book of life from beginning before the foundations of the earth. And he said, whom he foreknew, he predestined to become conformed into the image of his son Christ Jesus. You don't look like Jesus yet. So God's purpose is to change you. He is the potter, we are the clay. He continues to mold us and shape us. This is the upward calling of God in our lives. And the tool that he uses to do this is his word. And you know why? Because it cuts away the things that are not Jesus in our life. It's sharper than any two-edged sword. Isn't this what it says in Hebrews? Yes, it does. So it's like, you know, what God, it's like, you're all right, you know. <laughs> But there are parts of what's going on in your life and my life and Alice's life that are not godly. You know that and I know that. So what he is going to do is he's going to cut away the things in our life that don't look like Jesus. He does that with his word. Today, still, there are prophets. And God sends the prophets to cut away at what in your life doesn't look like Jesus. When that happens, rejoice. Hallelujah. Give thanks to God because He is accomplishing His wonderful, wonderful purpose in your life. That's right. And that should bring you joy. It may hurt for a little while. Yes, it only hurts for a little while. But it'll bring joy into your life. Remember, you know, I said the, the testimony of Jesus is the spirit of prophecy because Jesus is the prophet that the prophet prophesied of. Right, 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 right. <laughs> Moses said that God was going to send another prophet. prophet. I am a greater. And that prophet is Jesus Christ. Because Jesus not only brings the word, Jesus Christ is the word. Yeah. And when Jesus came to set the captives free, by the way, because if you have sin in your life, you're a slave to that sin in your life. Mm -hmm. That's what the word of God says. But when Jesus came to set us free, from the flesh, from all this stuff in our lives that doesn't belong in our lives. Here's how he began. In Matthew 4, 17, it says that Jesus began to preach and say, Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Hallelujah. That is so true. Mm. So, don't be afraid of repentance. Don't be afraid of change. Don't be afraid when God sends a word to discipline you. He does it because He loves you. And I promise you, if it hurts at all, it'll only hurt for a little bit. And it'll have wonderful, wonderful results. Yes. When we pick up again in our next session, because I'm not going to be able to do this now, we're going to talk about this part of these verses. Jesus said, For I say to you, that unless your righteousness surpasses that of the scribes and Pharisees, you will not enter the kingdom of heaven. All right? Let me just kind of recap something I've said. And, and this is kind of an oversimplification. The Beatitudes, that's a sermon. The rest is a commentary on, on that in order to train us to walk in the righteousness that Christ obtained for us. Okay? Mm -hmm. The Pharisees, and we'll, as I say, we'll, we'll do this in our next session, were the most religious. They were, they were so good at practicing their religion. Yes. And yet, Jesus said to the leaders among them, you snakes, you vipers, you whitewashed tombs, because it was all wrong. They thought they were living according to the law, and they were not. Mm -hmm. They thought they were living according to the prophets, mm -hmm. and they were not. It's about your heart, because God searches the heart, doesn't look at the outward appearance. David said this, and I'm going to end up with this in this section. Mm -hmm. Create me a clean heart. Mm -hmm. You know what the sacrifices of God are? A broken and contrite heart. We need to get that same attitude because David was a man after God's own heart. And our attitude would be, discipline me, Lord. Mm -hmm. Send your word into my life. Open the eyes of my heart that I would see wonderful things in your word and understand what needs to be changed in my life. Send those prophets of God into my life mm -hmm. 
to call me back into the right path that I should be walking with you. And that is my prayer as we close, Father, that each and every one of us would come closer and closer to you, but not just for our blessing, although I know that blesses us, but that your son Jesus Christ would be exalted, that people would see him in us, and they would see what we do in life, and that they would glorify you because of it. So Father, I just pray this in the precious name of your Son, Jesus Christ. And I thank you for all you've done for us. In his precious name. Amen.